Hey there guys. So for this episode of education, I wanted to cover a topic that isn't really well understood in, in the world of eating disorders, and that is the drug therapy of eating disorders. Now before I start, I just want to make it clear that there is no proven drug to help treat an eating disorder. There are drugs available that help alleviate the anxiety, but they in themselves are not useful for treating the underlying problem with the eating disorder. The treatment of an eating disorder is really complex, and the first and most obvious thing uh, f for treating an eating disorder that involves rapid weight loss is rehabilitation and refeeding to help you put on the weight again. The other forms of treatment involve therapy, so there are many types of therapy available, and I won't go into it in this episode, but if you do want to see an episode on this, please do let me know in the comments section below. But these include things like CBT, which is cognitive behavioural therapy, psychotherapy, there are so many kinds of therapy available, and they all target different aspects of thinking, and they just help you think in different ways to try and get over the eating disorder. But drugs in themselves are not useful for treating the eating disorder. So what kind of drugs are available uh, that are being used to treat people with eating disorders? Well, they, that, that all depends on what kind of eating disorder you have. The, the first kind of treatment sort of revolves around increasing the amount of serotonin available. So what is serotonin? Well, serotonin is a neurotransmitter, and by neurotransmitter, I mean it's something that is packaged in the ends of nerves. And when the nerve is excited, the wave of excitation goes down the nerve, hits the end of the nerve where it releases these, this, this serotonin in this case from these little vesicles that are stored in the bulb. And the serotonin then goes to act on the next nerve onto a receptor. And then that triggers the, the nerve to either fire or not fire. Hence, you're sort of regulating brain activity. So to, to help explain this a bit better, I think I'm going to get a, a diagram ready. So just wait, wait one sec. Okay, it took me a while to find a pen, but I'm finally back. So, I just I just told you about the neurotransmitter properties of serotonin. So, as I said, this is the nerve, and when it's excited, the wave of activity goes down the nerve, where it hits this little bulb at the end. So, I'm just going to blow this area up here. So, if you can just imagine that I'm magnifying on the bulbs, the bulb looks like that, okay, and then magnifying on that cell there. Just imagine it looking a bit like that. So as I said, in the end of this bowl, you've got little vesicles. And by vesicles, I just mean little packages. And in this package is the serotonin. And when the nerve is excited, you get a change in charge, essentially. So normally, the inside of the cell is more negative than the, than the outside, which is positive. And when it's excited, positive charge goes on the inside and the, the key factor here is calcium and calcium is what causes the, uh, the vesicles to fuse with the end bulb and when it fuses obviously the inside of the package can then be released into the cleft. So this is called the synaptic cleft and this causes the serotonin to be released and generally in um, in lots of literature, you'll see that serotonin is abbreviated to as 5-HT, okay? So don't, don't be confused if you see that, essentially. So then serotonin then acts on the next cell, where there's a receptor. And there are loads of different kinds of serotonin receptors. So then that, that nerve either gets excited or it gets inhibited, and therefore you regulate the activity of this nerve. So, as I said, the first class of drugs tend to regulate the amount of serotonin that's in this cleft here. So what happens when serotonin is finished in this cleft? Well, it gets re it gets reuptake into, into this cell by, by a transporter. And this is how the first class of drugs acts. So the first class of drugs that I want to talk to you about are the SS SSRIs, which are called the serotonin selective reuptake inhibitors. And things like this include, so you may have heard of sertraline, citalopram, fluoxetine. These all inhibit this reuptake 
tra um, transporter. And therefore, you can imagine, if you inhibit the reuptake, you're increasing the concentration of the serotonin in this cleft. And therefore, you're increasing the amount of activity at this nerve here. So why is this important? Well, it's thought that things like anxiety and depression are related to a reduced amount of serotonin. And I'll just, I'll just show you here. So depression here and anxiety here. Now, both of these are, are thought to be related to a reduction in the amount of serotonin, which is abbreviated to as 5-HT. And depression is also related to a reduction in the amount of dopamine. Now, dopamine is another neurotransmitter that's in the brain. And you, you may have heard of dopamine in the context of things like Parkinson's disease, where it's reduced because you get the destruction of the neurons. In depression, there's nothing related to that. It's just a reduction of it being released. And um, dopamine is related to things like being able to experience reward and pleasure. So you can imagine in depression, you don't feel that as much, which might explain why, why you don't feel it, because of the reduction in the amount of dopamine. And there's also a reduction in the amount of norepinephrine, which in the UK you'll call, you'll call noradrenaline. And again, this is thought to be related to stress and panic. So in anxiety, again, you've got reduction in the amount of serotonin, but in this case you've got an increase in the amount of norepinephrine. And as I said, this is related to stress and panic. So if you've got an increase in the amount of norepinephrine, you can imagine that you're feeling more stressed and panicked. And then you've also got a reduction in the amount of another neurotransmitter called GABA. Now, GABA is produced in an area of the brain called the nucleus accumbens. And with another part of the brain called the septal nucleus, it causes, it's, it's another reward center, essentially. And if you, if you can imagine, a reduction in the amount of GABA causes the sort of experience you get in anxiety. So, both, both anxiety and depression relate to a reduction in the amount of serotonin. So you can imagine that by inhibiting this reuptake uh, transporter, you can actually help depression and anxiety. And in both of these cases, if you're going to be treated with an SSRI, you shouldn't expect to have any effects for the first four to eight weeks. So that's one to two months. And this is because it's thought that there is a change in the way that your nerves sort of conduct and talk to one another. So if you are put onto these drugs and you don't feel an effect straight away, please don't stop taking them. This is the crucial time where the nerves are changing the way that they're firing, they're changing the way that they're responding. And if you can wait for that first one to two months, then you more than likely feel the effects of the drug, which is good.